We're here today with uh, Sioux College uh, Cougar Ath Director of Athletics, Paul Rossetti. How are you today, Paul? Good, good. How are you? Good, good. Biggest thing, we're sitting here. What was the inspiration in you deciding to bring a football program to, uh, to Sioux College? Oh, geez. That goes back a long time, I think. And I think it's probably been the aspiration of a lot of, uh, you know, football coaches, players uh, over many years. So it's not just a new, unique idea. Um, but certainly growing up in Sault Ste. Marie, always, you know, wishing that there was something post-secondary uh, that, that student athletes could take advantage of. Uh, it, with my background coaching uh, at the University of British Columbia and coaching junior football prior to that, seeing, you know, the, the uh, opportunity for student athletes to go into the trades and things of that nature, you know, the college route seems like a real nice fit. And uh, there was just never anything in the Sioux uh, where students who maybe didn't want to leave home or wanted to go into the trades or wanted to, you know, maybe just stay close to home for cost factor, had that opportunity to play football. So a lot of great football players were just not playing. Um, and I used to always lament that, you know, I used to think, wow, what a great, what a great city because of the history of football and how strong football is in the Sioux. Wouldn't it be awesome to have a post-secondary opportunity for, for student athletes in Sioux St. Marie. So I, uh, so again, I, I know I shared that vision with a, a great many uh, coaches and players, and have, you know that always comes up when you're sitting around talking with with uh, with coaches. And uh, so to to be able to put it together, to have the political will, the administration at Sioux College, uh, you know, the desire and the funding to do it has been awesome. So we're we're super appreciative of that, and really excited to see what it can turn into. And again, your your women's hockey team is at the ACHA, uh, like I say, national championships right now as we speak. Now, are you you going because with the success of your hockey programs, that does that just make it easier to model the football programs after the success they've had? Well, I think it you know it starts a little more grassroots level in terms of you know one of my visions uh, at Sioux College um, has been to go deep into sports where we have some really good grassroots. And I think hockey is a great indicator of that. I think hockey has been successful because of the talent and the, the hockey base in Northern Ontario, the interest level. We've been able to build some outstanding teams at the ACHA level. Um, I look at a program like baseball, like uh, that we partnered with the Black Sox to uh, build, you know, a program right now that that took on a couple big colleges last year and beat them. And we're excited about where baseball is going. But that, again, is another sport in Sault Ste. Marie that has some great tradition, great grassroots. Um, and then now moving into football, uh, it's cut from the same cloth. It's you know, we don't have to import uh, the entire roster from Southern Ontario or from Western Canada, we can, you know, we're going to have a lot of great homegrown products sort of in the, you know, the vein of guys like Andrew Gregg, when he played junior football here in the Sioux, you know, 30 years ago, uh, we're going to hopefully have that scenario where we have a good number of, of local guys that can be the core and drive this program. And, and of course we'll supplement that with players from out of town and out of province. Um, so, but if you don't have that great, core you know we've found that it's hard to compete and it's hard to to compete at a high level and be successful so that's part of the philosophy that i've had at the college has been to try and be you know immerse ourselves into sports that we have that that those really deep community roots and your your, your opening season is fall of 2025 right yeah correct so can you elaborate a little bit on the process of recruiting players for the inaugural season like where Sure. How big is your roster going to be and, and stuff like that? So the first thing, you know, again, part of my belief system is that we had to recruit and build the structure first uh, rather than sort of shoot first and aim later. I wanted to make sure that we had put together a great group of coaches, which we, we now have done. I want to get uh, a bunch of volunteers into the into the system, really understand what our capacity is at the college for housing and things like that. And, and then move out into sort of phase two which is the recruitment piece so recruiting is 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 underway now and we're we're just getting started uh we have a pretty good handle of course on the local uh, potential the group that's in grade 12 right now that could be returning grade 12s has a tremendous amount of talent we're excited about that hopefully we can we can lock up a few of them but um we also have divided sort of our staff and, and our scouts into six sort of regions and uh we'll be recruiting throughout northern ontario as sort of the the next key area uh you know we'll we have a few scouts and i should say 
three scouts in Southern Ontario and I have about three scouts in Western Canada and I'll be doing a good amount of the recruiting, even in terms of the international mix, because we're allowed um, six international players. So I have some uh, being part of team Canada and, and having traveled overseas with, uh, with football Canada. Uh, I have some good connections with the international um you know, football leagues. And so, you know, we're, we're going to fill, I think, six spots on our team with, with the international players, which is, our, you know, the maximum limit. And we keep on talking. I mentioned it was going to be last, but probably easier now. Can you talk about your scouts and your coaching? Then we're we'll going to the other questions. Sure. Sure. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, no particular order. I mean, we, you know, really nuts and bolts. We've, we've tried to include, uh, as many great community coaches and, and, uh, uh, guys with former university coaching experience or and or uh, playing experience into our roster. Obviously, the SaberCats uh, coaching staff was a uh, was a very key uh, piece of that. You know, working with those guys this past year for myself, getting to know a lot of them. Well, just outstanding coaches. Uh, most of them have signed on to work with us. So, for example, uh, you know, Matt Primo is going to be our associate head coach and, uh, you know, he's going to work with our receivers and again, has done an amazing job with that Sabercat program. Um, our assistant offense uh, coordinator will be Jamie Antonello. Again, very committed. You know, I love, love how committed he is. Uh, knowledgeable, bright, hardworking guy, grinds. He watches lots of film on the defensive side. Um, you know, Brandon Corelli and, and Christian Mahler, both uh, University of Waterloo grads, uh, are going to be co coordinating the defense, and again, both of them had outstanding uh, U Sport University careers, and have you know have been amazing coaches with the SaberCats for a number of years. We're adding into that mix guys like Jordan Hoover, who's going to bring that uh, you know CFL experience, which again, just an incredible career as a player, uh, certainly has has a lifetime of knowledge from his time in the CFL. Um, Mike Reed is going to be our special teams coordinator. Mike's uh, Another, you know, University of Waterloo standout, incredible coach. He's he's worked with the Steelers for the last few years as well. Um, uh, Travis Zorzit, who's a Sabercats alumni again, a really technical guy. We'll be working with our O-line. Sean McGonigal, uh, University of Guelph guy, I believe, was his playing career. Uh, it, it worked. I worked with him a bit at Superior Heights, an incredible receiver coach. Greg Caruso, who was the offense coordinator at St. Mary's, is going to be uh, working with our special teams and our running backs. Steve Hyma, who's been a long time uh, running back and, and standout, played some college football in the States, is going to be working with our running backs as well. Uh, Freddie Castleman, who's an Ottawa U grad, played had a great career at Ottawa U, is going to be working with our, you know, we're working with our D-line. Um, Sam Boston, who's uh, from, I worked with at Spear Heights, is sort of going to be our uh, scout team coordinator and academic liaison. So he's going to make sure that our guys get through school, which is super important. Uh, Steve, Mc, uh, Steve McLeod, a.k.a. Sliver, uh, is going to be working with our special teams as well and working with our kicking our kicking group. And, and one of the coaches I'm really excited about working with is uh, Lucinda Hatt, uh, or she goes by Cindy, I believe. And Cindy is uh, uh, lives in Los Angeles right now, but she's uh, from Sault Ste. Marie originally. It was huge in Western Canada in building uh, uh, women's touch and flag football programs. And I believe uh, she was on the Dragon's Den at one point. And I believe she's even had some interviews at the uh, at the NFL level in terms of her participation in um in, uh, in in football, so uh, she is expressed uh, reached out to me right away. Expressed expressed a desire to work with our defense and take on some other roles, and uh, we're excited to have our our first female coach as well. So, um, really, I think that's fourteen uh, coaches, and uh, really an awesome group. And always, uh, you know, there's some other coaches that are committed to their high school programs right now that we'd love to have, but I, but we understand that there'll be some coaches that, that, you know, aren't involved only because they're, they're, uh, they're, they're working, they're, they're, they're sort of building up those, those programs that we need to feed our program. So, and, and I use like the Crellies, the, some of the younger guys, are they stepping away from the teams that they're with, with high school to join you guys or? Well, the nice thing is, um, uh, you know, we, you know, we wanted to start in 2025. So there's a bit of a transition period 
there so that some of the younger guys that haven't had an opportunity to maybe be a coordinator or work their way up the football ranks will have that year to to sort of move up and develop and learn and i think that that gives the high school programs hopefully a bit of time to you know replace or groom you know other coaches for the roles uh, for the guys that might be leaving i think most of the guys on the list that i talked to uh, that are coaching for us will be still coaching their high school programs and their saber cap programs for the foreseeable future. Once our season starts, though, uh, you know our seasons run at the same time as the high school season, so they'll most well, they will be coaching with us. And uh, but I think that there's you know wherever there's sort of a you know a deficit like that, it creates more opportunity. And I know there's a, a tremendous amount of good young coaches that have been coaching uh, you know minor football in the summer. Uh, that will, I'm sure, take those reins and, and become better better for it. And uh, we continue to get applications for coaches from out of town, which maybe hopefully can add to our coaching pool in the long term of bringing in guys who maybe can add something to the program as well. And like I say, 2025, right now in Sault Ste. Marie, we have one turf field, that Superior Heights, and Rocky D. Piastro down at the John Rhodes like, property. For 2025, where what are you looking at for uh, playing I, I believe we're looking at right now playing at the John Rhodes, um, you know, the Rocky D field. It's, uh, you know, we, you know, we're sort of, we've had some preliminary discussions with the city regarding that and what might be, what that might look like and what we need as a program. Uh, the college has made a long-term commitment to explore the options of a turf field up here. And I, I know I've, I've been involved in some of those discussions and, and, and I, I believe it, it will happen. Um, the timing of it might not coincide with, um, with you know when we kick off our first year which would necessitate us uh, to be down at rocky d but you know those of those of us who've grown up in the football community in sault st marie know that 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 field has a lot of history and tradition behind it and uh, obviously there's things we can do to to continue to you know, improve that, that surface but we're you know we're going to work with the city on that to, to to see if we can create a really cool environment for uh for our for our inaugural season and 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 who knows how many years beyond and again, it's and it's not against the Pier Heights, but it's being a board, a board, like you say, facility. Rocky Di Pietro, like the Steelers, for instance, and being a college program, possibly a beer garden, right? Like it just helps with a, a college atmosphere, right? I, I, you know, I, I, without making any definitive statements, I think that would be certainly part of the vision. Would would you know to say that? Yeah, you know, college football having creating that social aspect, which you know, you're, you're right. doesn't necessarily mesh well with being close to a residential neighborhood. Not, not that, you know, there's anything that, you know, we're worried about, but I think it, you know, it, it, creating that game day experience that sometimes can be loud and exciting and fireworks and, you know, who knows what a, hopefully a touchdown celebration uh, tradition might become, but you know, that, that feel, you know, at Rocky D is perfect for us uh, to start on. And I always say, anybody who's played football over the 40s would rather play on the grass than the turf anyways, right? Yeah, you know, they, they keep coming back to these studies that say that uh, natural grass, you know, in, in some capacity has less injuries. And I, I think it depends on on how, you know, on, on a lot of factors. But, I mean, um, the city's done, a, you know, a, a decent job over the years of maintaining it. We, you know, if we partner, I, I, my hope is that through a partnership with, with us, uh, you know, at the college, we can continue to build that surface and, and turn it into something that's definitely a very, very playable. And, and, and trust me when I tell you this, I mean, my background before I was at UBC, I was the head coach at, in Victoria with the junior program there. And the, the field we, we played on, you know, wasn't even comparable to Rocky D, which tells you what the, you know, what sort of the, what, what, I, what I've come from and what I've, what I've seen. And uh, so I think for us, we're, we're, we'll be quite happy with that surface. And I used your going referring to a hockey program had quite a bit of fast success in the ACHA as as a new program coming in 2025. What benchmarks are you setting? Like you say, eventually you want a championship, but what are what are your well, early goals you know, compared to a championship? You know, I'm 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 a big believer in the process, and 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 the first step on any road for us is really going to be recruitment. So, you know. I know that's probably not, you know, I'm not looking at what that translates into. What I am looking at is uh, getting the best recruited program I could possibly have hitting the field come training camp in in uh, July of 2025. That's that's the number one milestone that we have to hit and being ready to go, you know, for the very first game in, in August of 2025. That's 
beyond that, I, you know, the results will take care of themselves if we, you know, if we're ready to go in terms of um, the talent that we have. And so really the, the entire focus at this point is just, you know, finding uh, good local talent and finding talent uh, from outside of the Sioux. I mean, it, it's, you know, anytime you start a new program, you, you know, there's going to be some growing pains and, uh, uh, you know, you referenced our hockey program, uh, you know, a, a real tribute to our coaches in terms of their recruiting and our scouts and everything else. And we would, we would love it if we can emulate that model and, 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 you know, but I'm, you know, we're not focusing on the, on the end goal. We're focusing on the process. So we're, we're trying to make sure that we were, we're taking care of recruiting first. And you're part of the CJFL, but also the OFC, that's the Ontario portion of it. Off top of your head, can you name the other, the other programs? Yeah. 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 The, uh, so there is um, the London Beef Eaters. They've been around for a long time. Uh, the St. Clair Saints, uh, which is, they're similar to us in terms of uh, their con- affiliation and connection with uh, St. Clair College. Uh, at one point, St. Clair was the Windsor AKO Fratman. Uh, then you have the Ottawa Sooners, another very storied program that's been around for over 60 years. Um, you have the Hamilton Hurricanes. Uh, again, has, we had, I, I think... First couple of years in the Sioux, way back when, when there was junior football, had some good battles with Hamilton. Um, then moving from there, you have the Quinty Skyhawks, as well as the GTA Grizzlies. So those are, with us, I, I think that makes seven. So we'll have a seven-team league. And then across the country, there's 20 CJFL teams. So, and I use, again, St. Clair is really the only tie to the other education, right, for the for the league? Right. Yeah. I, there. I mean, there are there are schools that have supported, like uh, Loyalist College out of Kingston uh, supports the Quinty Skyhawks with uh, field space, and you know, I think there's some loose affiliations with some other colleges across the country. Uh, I know UBC Okanagan supports the Okanagan Sun in Kelowna, so there are some connections. But I think. Um, you know, we we are definitely all in as a college here, and uh, we're excited about you know having another varsity program. And as a program in this year, I don't know if you even discuss this with a school or being the director of athletics and also head coach. I'll uh, use St. Clair for instance. St. Clair has a rule of so many players that don't have to be really in the going to school, but to also play. And they've done that themselves. Is that something your program is looking at, or how are you working that? Um. <clears throat> You know, that's a, that's a tougher question. I, I think for us, you know, we recognize that the, the lion's share of the funding for this program is, is coming from our college. And so as such, we want to make sure that we are recruiting pl- uh, uh, student athletes. I, I'm not sure what the ratio is. I did speak to the uh, coaches at St. Clair a while back, and I think they have a pretty small number of uh, players. Uh, very, it might be less than a half a dozen that uh, have no – no class requirements or no class affiliation at their college. Um, You know, if we, for argument's sake, let's say we have a 60 man roster and we had 10% or less that were non-affiliated class wise, that might be something that's possible, but to start, we're really trying to encourage, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, sort of set the bar as, uh, you know, our student athletes will have to be attending the college in some capacity, Uh, you know, otherwise there's no value for the college to get into football, right? Now, question we, we could have done right from the first, but what age group is, are when it comes to CJFL are is is the ages we're looking at? So uh, it goes, I mean, you know, I have had, when I was in Victoria, I had players as young as 17, but typically starts after high school, so 18, uh, and it goes up to, you can't be turning 23 before, I believe it's uh August 1st of your final year. So you really can't be a 23 year old unless you have an early birthday. Um, So there are some that turn 23 after the season's midway through that can continue to finish those seasons. But so really nuts and bolts, 18 to 22 year olds. And and again, I know it's 2025, but do you know what a a sample of the season would look like when it comes to mounting games home and away? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the uh, right now we're looking at probably eight an eight game season with. Uh, I, I would love to have an exhibition game, so a nine game season before playoffs. Uh, whether there's five on the road or four at home or vice versa, that's sort of what I think it will shake down to. I know out west in in both uh, the PFC, which is a Prairie Conference, and the BCFC, uh, they play a ten game season. But I uh, 
but I know in, in the OFC, they play an eight game season. And like you say, what kind of impact do you expect on the football program to have it with it when it comes to stu- student enrollment and retention, like for the football program? Well, I think we'll find that we'll have some, you know, probably, you know, half a dozen to a dozen student athletes playing on our football team that probably Sioux College was their choice anyways. Now, fortunately for them, you know, if they went into, you know, um, you know, if they went into any of our programs, aviation, nursing, whatever it might be, uh, they're going to have that opportunity to play football. Beyond that, with a 60-man roster, I'm really hoping that we can have sort of 50 to, you know, 60 unique students that attend the college as a result of the program. And then some of the uh, spin-off, uh, you know, periphery students, you know, somebody's coming because their cousin has decided to come to Sioux College or, you know, girlfriend's coming because uh, the boyfriend's coming now. You know, I think I'm hoping that, you know, when all said and done, we'll be 80 to 100 new domestic or and, and six international students uh, coming to play football. Now, is Michigan international? Or do you, does the school recognize them as, as local? So the way it works is uh, you're allowed to have um, six internationals, of which only three can be American. Um, and, you know, we... You know, I've been fortunate because of my time spent with Football Canada and traveling overseas... I've seen some great international squads, and I think there's quite uh, the level of football at this sort of, you know, um, just post high school age is tremendous. And so while it's, you know, low hanging fruit to get some American players, uh, the football in Mexico and Germany and uh, Austria uh, is really remarkable. And and a lot of those international students are very highly motivated. I know St. Clair's. I think brought over four or five players from the UK. Uh, so those key, those players, those student athletes are very very motivated, and they wanna they wanna come and get a North American football experience. So I'm excited about where we can go with that. And we have had some Sioux guys go over and play in Europe after after yep. they're done playing I playing one. here. I was so. one. I played I played in the UK. So you know, and I had such a great time. And and, and uh, now, granted. You know, I mean, that was 30 some years ago. So the football today in Europe is is much, much better than it was. And, and you know, people don't realize this, but there's, you know, again, probably 50, um, 50 countries right now playing organized tackle football. It's unbelievable. Uh, it was only a few years ago the uh, the world championships were in Kuwait and uh, Japan uh, has over 110 colleges and universities that play tackle football. So people don't realize these things, but uh, North America is not, not the only place that is, is playing the game. And again, I use in Canada, we say football and that's American football. Yeah. You talk to a soccer person, it's football, right? Yeah. But yeah. outside of North America, we just think of football or soccer, right? You don't think of yeah, football yeah. outside sure. of North America, right? You're right. Yeah. And that's where the NFL is opening up when they go over to exhibition games into Europe because of, like you say, how big the following is, is over there, right? Yep. Yep. And it's growing. I mean, uh, you know, North America football, unfortunately has been a sport over the last decade or or more. That's it's slowly retracting a bit in the younger and amateur levels, but in Europe and uh, Mexico and uh, you know, even uh, Southeast Asia, it's a sport that's, that's growing. It's uh, you know, the, the, the world championships I was fortunate to be part of were in China. And so I think if it ever catches hold there, you'll see, you know, just a, an explosion of, of participants. So, um, yeah, it's it's really turned into a global game and it probably as noticed by the fact that flag football is now going to be an Olympic sport. And is there anywhere to compare, like you say, this CFJ, CJFL compared to anything in the university like levels? Can you compare it to Cowboys? Yeah, so, so the way I've always, uh, you know, having – coached at all three levels, I, I really, you know, genuinely believe the CJFL is the perfect intermediate step. So it's definitely much better than what you would get, you know, that probably, you know, than, than the high school level. It's, uh, it, you know, it's one rung up probably from the, uh, you know, Sabercats or OSFL level. It's not uh, as good as Canadian University. When I say not as good, I mean not as resourced. And resources make a huge difference. Uh, having, first of all, having all the, the time, the money, uh, the full time coaches, you know, the amount of time that players have to spend going through film and 
assistants that are working with them and varsity gyms that are, you know, catered to them. And th those resources at the university level make a huge difference. All that said, every year there's probably a half a dozen to a dozen CJFL players that graduate from their CJFL team and go straight into the CFL. So it's a, a very high caliber league, uh, but I would say on the whole, it's, it's probably that middle rung between sort of high school and, and university. And, you know, I often would tell high school guys, when you leave high school to go to a university program, it's, it's sort of like you're a grade nine trying to make it on a team full of grade 12s, right? That's the jump. And sort of, I think junior football probably would fit in that grade 10, grade 11 area, right? So, so, so it's, it's perfect for a lot of guys that need to develop their skills. The nice thing, the message I always tell everybody is you have seven years, essentially, post high school to play five years of, of university football. And uh, if you can play a couple of years of junior, uh, it, it does wonders for the scholarship amount that you'll get, uh, where you'll end up on the team, on the depth chart, uh, how many people are interested in you, because you're a finished product, so to speak, at 20 or 21 and university coaches that are coming after you, they're looking to put you in a starting role. They're going to give you a bigger scholarship. So it's a really nice developmental uh, um, you know, situation. And it allows players who love football to play two years of a junior and then play five years of university, turn their post-secondary football experience into seven years in instead of turning it into, you know, two or three, because typically what will happen is players make that jump and very few high school guys will make the jump into university and play in their first year, maybe not even their second year. I mean, I know quite a few who, you know, they're year three before they step on the field. And, and I was one of those guys. So, you know, you, you, you end, and then you end up playing until your degree is over. So you've turned your five years of eligibility into two, you know, you've really actually played for two. Right. And so uh, junior, I wish we had junior football in Sault Ste. Marie when I was growing up, I would have played it for sure. Uh, it, you know, fantastic developmental ground. But then that shows the development in Sault Ste. Marie. Now we have, say Sioux Minor, we have high school, we have Sabercats, and now we're going to have the Sioux College Cougars. It shows that w the talent that we have in our city in the Northern Ontario, right? Yeah, I, I, you're, that's, a, a that's a great point. I don't think people realize, you know, and it's a real tribute to the guys like, you know, uh, Tom Manet and Jim Monaco and those guys who came before them, you know, your uh, Marty Smith and your John Kovich those type of guys who who built uh, football in the suit, how deep the roots go, how strong uh, the community football is in Sault Ste. Marie. When I was coaching in Western Canada, people actually would stop and take notice of, you know, the number of kids that they, you know, people used to think Sault Ste. Marie must be about 200,000 people because of the number of kids that were playing football at the university level or at the junior level and how good and talented they were. And that, and that doesn't even include the ones that left football because they didn't want to leave the Sioux. They wanted to maybe go to the college and, and take a trade or do something different and were prepared to leave to go uh, play uh, university football. A great example I always think of is, uh, you know, a guy like uh, Matt Goche. Matt Goche played junior football for me in Victoria. And I, you know, he had just a ton of guy, a ton of coaches at the university level that would have taken him in a heartbeat, you know, out of, out of college. And, and that wasn't necessarily his path, but there's a guy who I think, and from everything I hear about his brother, I've seen him a ton, but probably a couple guys that could have ended up playing in the CFL had they had a maybe a four-year junior career, you know, in Sault Ste. Marie or at the junior level. Um, so junior football has a great, it's just, a, it just creates so many more opportunities for players. And, and then the Sioux is, it, we're just loaded with, with players that, that don't even go on to university that, that probably could play at the university level, but just don't. And, and you were mentioning about, like you say, the, the junior level and then post-secondary, like your university and colleges, so it doesn't affect the um, eligibility at all. So the rule has changed a number of times, and it, and you know, and don't quote me when I say this, but and it may still change. Who knows? It, but over my time as a coach in university sports, I think the eligibility rule changed three times. The way the rule sits now, to the best of my knowledge, is that you can't turn 26 before your final before the final season of play so you can play up until you're 25 which typically for most kids is or most you know high school graduates is about a seven-year window so if you took your first two seasons and you played junior and you were 20 uh you know by the time you left junior football you would still have five full seasons left now there there may be some small exceptions to that rule if you have a late birthday or 
potentially if you were held back in, in you know, in school or whatever, there, there may be, there may be, or, you know, some, you may only have four, but, but for the most part, everybody gets two full seasons of junior for free without losing any university eligibility. And I haven't even seen cases where, where players have had three years of junior and still managed to play five years of uh, U sport. I had a player at uh, Western Victoria who was 17 when he came to play for me. So he played three years of junior and then still played five years of university. So uh, it's not as much about, you know, um, using a year of junior it's more about the final age you are when you when you finish at the okay. university now so. with with your football program like say how how do you see like you say that contribute to the school's overall reputation the visit vill, 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 visibility visibility of our of the college both locally and nationally sorry about that well i mean you know I, I, we're already sort of experiencing it with hockey uh, you know, when our men's and women's hockey team have won national championships, we get messages from across the province and uh, people are, are taking note of it, even, you know, in schools and colleges across Ontario that don't uh, have hockey, that the OCAA, where we play most of our sports, doesn't have hockey. So they, but they, they take notice of what we're doing in the world of hockey. So that that's, I, I think football can be very uh, similar. Uh, the football community is is uh, very passionate across Canada, but it's not massive. Uh, so when we made the announcement that we were going to attach football to our college, uh, I was getting messages from Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, you know, Western Canada. It, you know, it, it's people know, you know, and there and there's sort of been a movement afoot now. There's a lot of passionate football people that are are starting to approach their local colleges and say, hey, could could we do something similar to what Sioux College is doing? So I've always believed that. Uh, you know, the old NCAA saying that the, you know, sports are the porch of your, of your college. You know, you got to walk through the porch to get to the house, right? So people see it. It's the first thing they see. Uh, and it waves the flag for what you are reputationally. It's, I've heard many, you know, university presidents uh, who who said you, you can't be, you know, well-regarded as an academic institution if your, if your sports are complete bottom feeders. And I, and I believe that. I think you have to have, if you want to send the message that you have a quality, institution you know i think it you know your sports uh, have to have to be likewise so i i'm i i think our admin is they they uh, value sport they've invested in it our, our board uh, they value sport they've invested in it, i think which is why we're we're looking at the new uh, turf field potential um and i i think if we're successful it um you know, it's going to have a big impact on, you know, what, how the college is viewed. I, that's my hope. That's my goal. And, uh, and I think, uh, even where we're viewed in the football world, but, but ultimately that's always been my goal since I arrived at the college was to try and create sports where, uh, we could be a real, uh, you know, we could wave, wave the flag for Sioux college and, and the the level of excellence that we have both on and off the field and in the classrooms, et cetera. So you have about actually we're talking right now about 18 months for you to be ready to field a team that's averaging about three players a month. Any pressure there at all? You know, it's, it's, uh, I I got, I have to give credit to my wife on that because when I, when I I took over the program in Victoria back in 2005 and I had uh, three and a half months to basically take an expansion team to its first game. And I had to recruit 60 to 65 players and, my wife reminded me of what that process was like, and we did have 65 players, but uh, there were a lot of lot of long days on the recruiting trail to get to that stage. So having a longer runway is, I think, a bit of a stroke of genius. I'm really happy about the fact that we decided to wait because I I'm just a believer that we want to we want to come out of the gates, you know, we, we want to come out of the gates strong. We want to be uh, firing on all cylinders and having you know uh, really put our best foot forward in year one. Because I, I believe that if we we put a, a solid product out there and we're competitive, that's that's again a word I'll, I'll use is you know we're not talking about where we're going to finish record that we want to be competitive. We want to be in every game. We want to be competitive. If we can do that in year one, then the future is real bright. And and uh, part of the reason I, I thought you know we want to give ourselves time to do that because the opposite is true. If you if you come out in year one and you're you know zero and eight, um, you're not giving even your local guys a great you know, reason to want to be part of the program. So, um, you know, that's really important to me. I, 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 there's always pressure. There's always things that we can be doing. I wanted to, to take a lot of time to build the back end of, of what we're doing and our processes and have everything in place before we really hit the recruiting trail hard so that we, so we know that if we need to bill it, 
student athletes or if we they want to get into certain programs we're all aware of, of what that process looks like and uh and so now you know we have some time and this summer is going to be great with the with the osfl sabercat um league i'll be i'll still be coaching sabercats this summer so i could get a chance to really talk to coaches and players post game pre-game about our program and i i'm 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 encouraged we have a lot of people that are in our corner as far as recruiting and uh i'm, I'm really encouraged that we'll uh, if anything i think we might have some tough decisions trying to get down to 60 players i i'm hoping to run a training camp uh or a trial camp probably next may with about 120 players and i think we're going to be looking at how can we cut that group down to 120 so or sorry down to 60. And I use, again, it's just talks, preliminary talks right now with the school and everything, but having your own turf field would surely help with recruiting, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, program is as large as football, you know, it, it's uh, it's a real bonus to have that. I, you know, I, I still genuinely believe that that's the direction we're going to be uh, going in in the near future. Um, and, it, you know, yeah, it's great for recruitment. Um you know, but I, I think there's a lot of other things that come into the recruitment piece. There's opportunity, you know, opportunity to, to, to develop, to get better. Uh, we'll provide a great experience for our student athletes, regardless of uh, what point our, our turf field comes online. And again, Rocky D has, again, a perfect setup, has two dressing rooms. Like you say, you are the, the connected to the arena, so still a good facility for, for those 60 players for uh, coming to play football, right? Yeah, I mean... You know, I wish we could all just snap our fingers and have new fields. You know, it, it's a process, right, to get to get a new field. And we know we're going to, you know, I, I, again, I, I I don't know if I should say, but I feel very confident that we'll get a new field at the college in the not too distant future. So, uh, you know, Rocky D is, is probably going to be that uh, interim home for us, but, but we're excited about uh, being there. Well, Paul, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today, and we'll, we'll hopefully we can do this next, say, next June when you've cut your down to at least 60 to 80 guys, or I yeah. shouldn't say guys because females like say, you never know. Right. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. you, you have Lily and Sachin with, uh, with, uh, Man, with Cora that's played right. at, at the Ontario level now. So you, you never know. Right. Well, and I believe the place kicker for the university of Manitoba is, is female. So yeah, you just, you never know. So, um, but yeah, thanks for the time. I love it. And, and we're all pretty excited in the football world right now. Well, thank you. Okay. Take care.